Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're very excited for our next Pan American Hemodynamics Collaborative Webinar in association with the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center. Before we get started, we have some very exciting news about NHRC. Um, there is now an available up and running YouTube channel that you can join uh, to look at the different didactics and conferences that have been put on by the center. There is also an exciting opportunity to join the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center. We are now opening this up um, to different centers that do neonatal hemodynamics around the world. If you are involved in a center around the world doing neonatal hemodynamics, or if you know of a center that's doing that, please don't hesitate to contact us at the email listed here to learn more about how to join this group. And without further ado, I will introduce our panelists and then our excellent speaker. So I am joined today um, as a moderator with Dr. Amis Jane, and we would like to introduce the panelists. Um, Dr. Altit is a neonatologist that comes to us from McGill University in Montreal. He has recently launched and is the director of a neonatal hemodynamics clinical research fellowship at McGill and has started the NeocardioLab webpage and an exciting app that is now available for all to use. We're also joined by Dr. Levy, who's a neonatologist at Harvard. He has extensive experience in evaluating measures of cardiac function, specifically with right heart physiology and pulmonary hemodynamics and preterm neonatal cohorts. We're also joined by Dr. Doc Dakshina Morty, a professor of pediatrics and physiology in the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. She runs the pulmonary, pulmonary biology lab there, um, as well as a part of the Children's Hospital Research Institute. Her research interests are expansive in the physiology of newborn pulmonary circulation. As you can tell, we've created an excellent group of people um, to complement our speaker. Our speaker comes to us um, from UT Southwestern. Dr. Goss is a pulmonary and critical care physician. She has done extensive research in both preclinical models as well as clinical studies of the long-term cardiopulmonary effects of premature birth. Please help us welcome her for her presentation on pulmonary vascular disease and young adults born preterm. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really um, a privilege and a pleasure to join you guys today and share some of our work in young adults who were born preterm. So I became interested in this topic um, more than a decade ago. I was a medical student and then a resident in internal medicine and pediatrics combined. And I remember asking staff members, it really didn't matter if they were new faculty or more seasoned, experienced faculty, what happens to these babies when they grow up? I really was intrigued um, by the extremes of physiology that we were seeing in the NICU. And strikingly, the answer was usually the same, regardless of who I asked. The response was always, well, we think they do okay, but honestly, we really just don't know yet. And why is that? Why did they not know yet? And why are we still struggling to identify these long-term risks? Well, you guys know the answer to this. This is um, the result of dramatic changes in modern neonatal care. And with such improved survival, we now have more potential for long-term morbidity uh, than what we've seen previously. And this really has resulted in large part from a, um, interventions that have resulted in, in a decline in the age of fetal viability, initially around 32 weeks in the 70s and 80s and so forth, now down to as low as 22 to 23 weeks in larger academic medical centers. And I think that this is really remarkable, but in addition to these advancements in the NICU, it has led to an entire generation of new survivors of extreme prematurity who are now making it out of the NICU, not just surviving their NICU days, um, but in many cases surviving and thriving in early childhood through early adulthood. And this generation that's coming is certainly at increased risk for a number of um, comorbidities long-term that we're just now beginning to see the long-term effects of. 
we have known for a long time that respiratory outcomes could be a problem in these individuals. That was really obvious because of how much um, pulmonary morbidity we see early on, particularly with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So for many, many years, people have focused on respiratory outcomes in addition to neurocognitive and so forth as one of the key um, places for research in um, outside of the NICU, so adolescents and adults born preterm. And this is fairly well characterized at this point. We know that these babies, as they age into adolescence and adulthood, tend to have lung function evidence of lower FEV1 and FEF2575. So these are pulmonary function metrics that uh, designate increased obstructive uh, lung disease or airflow obstruction, such as what we would see in asthma or COPD. They tend to have more respiratory symptoms, although I will point out, you really have to drill down to get that symptomatology, because if you ask them a basic, how you doing, they'll say, I feel fine. And it's really because this is how they've always been. You really have to um, ask some specifics to get the details that they really have more symptoms than a, than a term-born uh, peer. They tend to have more airflow obstruction, more bronchial hyperreactivity, and as a result, are much more likely to be diagnosed with asthma, prescribed asthma medications, although it's not at all a classic eosinophilic asthma and really probably merits its own uh, diagnostic criteria and so forth as we begin to understand what this looks like long term. Interestingly, across these studies, we're seeing reduced diffusion capacity, and that's irrespective of whether or not you had a diagnosis of BPD in the NICU, as well as reduced exercise tolerance in the, um, prior studies. But until recently, and by recently, I really mean over the course of the last decade, we've had a substantial lack, on, lack of data regarding pulmonary vascular outcomes, both short and long-term. So as I started to look at this um, about a decade ago now, uh, we, we sort of approached the idea of pul late pulmonary vascular disease after preterm birth and sort of the same paradigms or um, uh, sort of setup that what we see in alveolar disease and COPD and for so forth. The reason for that is we know that in development and growth, the airway and vascular growth are really paralleled. And if you inhibit one, you, you by default inhibit the second, um, such that both are required for normal lung growth and development. So we thought that pulmonary vascular um, development and growth would follow a typical alveolar growth pattern. And what I mean by that, you have this increase in vascular density and vascular surface area that peaks in late childhood, early adulthood. We think that that's probably early 20s um, in, an out, in the um, airspace world. So probably something similar with vascular development. And then sort of slowly declines with age. However, in certain circumstances where you have a disruption in vascular development, so this may be our preterm infants, those especially with um, particular genetic conditions, environmental or epigenetic exposures, they may have a decrease in their total vascular density and vascular surface area um, that sort of becomes more apparent with time and may lead to an increased risk for overt pulmonary vascular disease as an adult. But even more so, they may be more, more susceptible to later secondary pulmonary insults. So tobacco exposure, hypoxia, infections, COVID would obviously be in that category now. Um, and so the, the concept that we were approaching this with was one that these um, are, you know, our former preterm, now young adults may be at increased risk for pulmonary vascular disease through one of multiple potential mechanisms. So I want to look at these long-term vascular outcomes, because like I mentioned, they really have been uh, published uh, largely in just the last uh, five or so years. Initially, as we were starting this, um, starting our work at, um, during my fellowship and then subsequent faculty position at the University of Wisconsin previously, a lot of what we had to look at were these epidemiologic-based studies. And these two that I'll discuss first came from Sweden. They were part of the pulmonary arterial hypertension registry there, where they have very nice um, national healthcare records and systems that they were able to take individuals who were born preterm from the birth records and sort of overlay that birth history with individuals who are diagnosed with overt pulmonary hypertension and identified a nearly five-fold increased risk for the development of pulmonary hypertension relative to those who are born term um, and uh, among the adults. They went and did a very similar analysis subsequently in their child and adolescent registry for pulmonary hypertension. 
And here, the odds ratio for disease is even higher, more than eightfold increase. And I think that that is truly a reflection of increased survival and increased prematurity rates uh, that we're seeing that greater incidence in younger populations and that greater risk. I think that as our current individuals continue to age, that will sort of, that increased risk will sort of bleed into those adult years as well. So let's talk about sort of a couple of different studies across the years and across the um, across the years outside of the NICU. And the first one uh, comes from Dr. Levy, um, where he invited 80 preterm infants and 100 match term born uh, control infants to come in for echo screening at a year. Using uh, non-invasive metrics uh, identified that pulmonary artery acceleration time here was lower in both the group of preterm infants with BPD and in those without BPD here. And so pulmonary artery acceleration time is a metric that's been associated with pulmonary vascular disease and the presence of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and so you see here a non-invasive way to assess these individuals, these babies at a year, that even those who are born preterm without BPD tend to have some degree of underlying pulmonary vascular disease. Interestingly, this correlates fairly closely with their gestational age. So this concept that it may not just be about the bronchopulmonary dysplasia and that in a um, developmental injury pattern, but also the growth and development of the pulmonary vasculature itself uh, may be interrupted and lead to that impairment or reduction in pulmonary artery acceleration time. So that's what these, you know, early evidence outside the NICU at a year that they have some degree of pulmonary vascular disease, what about if we march forward a decade and the next study is at age eight, at age 11 to 14 year olds. This was again an echo study, non-invasive measures in almost 200 individuals who were born preterm with a gestational age of 27 weeks uh, compared to 110 term born uh, adolescents here. So they have three groups, again, those who are born preterm with a history of BPD, those who are born preterm without a history of BPD, and then those who are born at term. And I've highlighted, this was a number of metrics looking at cardiac function and also pulmonary vascular metrics by ECHO, but I've highlighted a few here. So at the bottom of this table, we have systolic and mean pulmonary artery pressure. What you can appreciate is in the term group, normal PA um, pressures here with, this, with a mean PA of 16.6. But as we go backwards into these prior groups, those who are born preterm without BPD and those who are born preterm with BPD have a higher mean pulmonary artery pressure. So some evidence of pulmonary vascular dysfunction or disease um, in uh, in a number of these individuals within the study. And it's not just evidence of pulmonary vascular disease specifically, um, but also evidence of right ventricular dysfunction. So TAPSI is a metric to look at right ventricular dysfunction this displacement of the valve, the tricuspid valve itself. So the more contractile the heart, the greater that movement is, uh, the less contractile lower function is a lower movement of the tricuspid annulus. You can see here in the individuals with BPD, a significantly lower TAPSI score relative to those who are born at term and sort of this graded effect. So certainly while the, the differences in uh, pulmonary vascular disease are not hugely different in the preterm with and without BPD here or uh, pulmonary artery acceleration time noted here, I think there are fairly significant um, impact on the right ventricle that I think this you know, BPD really has an impact on that you see here. So this evidence of right ventricular function then that we're seeing in adolescence um, by echo. So with those to you know, a couple of studies to sort of march us out in age, I'll begin uh, to share some of our studies from the Newborn Lung Project cohort when I was at the University of Wisconsin. And the goal of this study was to look at the long-term effects of preterm birth on the ventricular vascular access, specifically targeting um, these individuals. So we recruited individuals who were born preterm uh, from the Newborn Lung Project cohort. They were uh, born in 1988 to 1991, all with a birth weight less than 1,500 grams, average gestational age of 28 weeks. And this was a prospective cohort that had been followed a number of times over the years um, 
that, that we began recruiting for this study. In addition, we recruited healthy controls who were brought in from the local population. And all of these subjects were free from known adult cardiopulmonary disease. They were not on um, antihypertensives. They were allowed a PRN albuterol, and that was really about it from a respiratory standpoint. They were all non-smokers. So I bring that up just to say that we really did get what I consider sort of the best of the best of our former um, preterm adult adults to be able to bring in a fairly healthy, fit, former preterm individual. We invited these individuals to come in for three visits for our adults. The first visit was a screening visit where they underwent pulmonary function testing, including spirometry and diffusion capacity. We also had them complete a maximal exercise test on an upright bike. They came back for a second visit where they completed a cardiac MRI. Um, there were some um, metrics done with exercise during that scan. So there are, are um, that's the stepping device that we used here. And then last was a right heart cath, including exercise at 70% of their maximal um, exercise capacity and power that was determined by their visit one VO2 max. So pretty intensive study. So what did we find? First of all, um, a striking number of these individuals did actually have pulmonary hypertension. So these were on average 28 weeks again, and they're now 27 years of age, and we have evidence of underlying pulmonary vascular disease in roughly half. So mean pulmonary artery pressure is shown here, our preterm individuals in red, and roughly half of them have a mean pulmonary artery pressure above 20. Um, obviously, it's a small sample size, but I do think that this is highly relevant for our adults who are born preterm. None of them had clinical overt symptom signs of heart failure or where you would have suspected underlying pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary hypertension. And you may look at this and think, well, that's not a very big increase. Even in the ECHO study that I showed before this, you may look at it and think that this is not a very big increase. It may not be that big of a deal uh, to have a mild increase in pulmonary artery pressure. And I would say unequivocally that that's false. Um, we know now from much larger database studies in adults, not born preterm, all comers with pulmonary hypertension, that any elevation in pulmonary artery pressure, mean pulmonary artery pressure specifically, is associated with increased mortality. We previously defined mean pulmonary artery pressure as greater than 25, which was the red line here originally. And that number has now been actually dropped to defining me, uh, pulmonary hypertension as a mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 20 for adults. So I, I say that because we now recognize that all of these individuals here with a pressure above 20 would be considered abnormal by the current diagnostic thresholds, which have recently been revised. In addition to elevated pressures, we saw L um, evidence of elevated resistance in elastins. So you can see the preterm group here, again, about half falling above um, one to two standard deviations for the term normal group here. And same for elastins. So this idea that we have a stiffer, uh, less distensible, less recruitable vascular bed begins to emerge. But I think you can actually see that best perhaps when we ask these individuals to exercise. So when we ask them to exercise as they increase their cardiac output, the slope of this line here for the preterm individuals, we see a greater slope or a greater rate of rise such that every liter per minute of blood flow that goes through the pulmonary vasculature results in a greater increase in pulmonary artery pressure, uh, which may then be reflected on the RV and results in greater workload during exercise for these individuals. We looked at neonatal predictors and uh, among, we had pretty extensive uh, list and uh, phenotyping from the neonatal days for these for this cohort in particular. And our best predictor was actually total number of days on ventilation. That was a composite of both invasive and non-invasive CPAP days. I will point out that the number of CPAP days overall in this um, older late 80s, early 90s cohort was fairly low. So I think it's still um, to be determined a little bit the extent to which CPAP uh, in current um, you know current practice would would be different here, um, but certainly total ventilation days was our best predictor, even stronger than gestational age for that elevation in pulmonary artery pressure. And you can see much of that's driven by our individuals with a history of BPD. So I'll summarize uh, the first section, first few slides here, that overall we have a stiffer, less recruitable pulmonary vascular bed in the individuals born preterm. 
For most, I think that this is likely to be mild or subclinical pulmonary hypertension when present, but that doesn't excuse it as being a non-issue when you consider um, that even these mild elevations may have significant mortality impact over the lifetime. And then finally, I do think for certain susceptible and vulnerable individuals, this likely serves as a, as a first hit for the development of more severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. And um, specifically because adult pH is often thought to be a multi-hit uh, phenotype that develops. We sort of um, add these, compile these studies over time and look at this. I think that they have persistent pulmonary vascular disease for the lifetime. It may be subclinical, but if you sort of consider the distribution of pulmonary artery acceleration time with these being the term, the uh, preterm without BPD and the preterm with BPD, you can see that there's fairly consistently, there's, there's always a separation in these lines. I think, you know, we don't have any sort of longitudinal data, but I think if we use a little bit of imagination here until we get that, I, I do think that this is likely to be a sort of pers persistent phenotype that we should be looking at and tracking over time. And we see that in pulmonary artery pressure as well. So I want to back up a minute so I, to this exercise phenotype, because I mentioned it in a couple slides ago, but one of the most striking findings as we asked these individuals to exercise during the right heart cath was really this inability to augment stroke volume during exercise in our preterm group. So we see here uh, in red, our preterm individuals do have a blunted stroke volume, or a, bl a blunted cardiac index response. The heart rate response is normal and preserved, but the stroke volume index response is very flat, whereas our term controls have a nice increase in their stroke volume. And so in looking at this, you know, I think we all expected as we were going into this study that we would see some degree of pulmonary vascular disease. Why else would we ask these individuals to come in for an invasive cath-based study, but the degree to which they could not augment their stroke volume was quite striking in my mind. And turns out we were not just seeing that in the, in the adults who were in this study, but we had a parallel study in adolescents born preterm. Um, they were um, early 2000s with a gestational age of 28 weeks, current age of 13 years. This was completely non-invasive, not cath-based, was bioimpedance-based, but we see very similar findings. So again, at higher exercise and higher exercise duration and intensity, we see that cardiac output uh, flatten in the adolescents born preterm, a normal heart rate response, and very similar, this very flat at blunting of the stroke volume index response to exercise. So the suggestion that they really do not augment their stroke volume uh, well in response to exercise. And around the same time, um, Adam Lewandowski at Oxford published fairly similar results, again, uh, in a group of adults, but this time by echo, looking at stress echo. This is with ejection fraction, so it's not stroke volume, but I think you get the same concept that they, in essence, uh, have similar ejection fraction at rest. This is all on the left side, um, left-sided LB ejection fraction. They increase some in the preterm here in red, and then again, have a decline and much more blunting of the ejection fraction reserve. Um, that than what we would see in a term-born adult undergoing exercise. So clearly there are cardiac implications uh, to preterm birth as well. And I want to touch on that just for a minute before we'll circle back to some of the pulmonary vascular outcomes. The, the group that we had at Wisconsin, um, we had 58 adolescents and adults who were born preterm who underwent cardiac MRI. So it was um, all of those who were included in the cath based study, plus um, quite a few more adults and adolescents, ultimately um, average gestational age of 29 weeks. And one of the really striking findings that's well outlined in the image here is actually simply a smaller heart. Uh, smaller left ventricular chamber sizes, smaller right ventricular chamber sizes in the preterm compared to what we see in the term. And if I look at that in a little bit more detail, I know this slide is busy, so I'll highlight a few key findings. We look at LV in diastolic, in systolic, and stroke volume indexes. So whether we look at the adolescent group or the adult group, or this final column here is combining all of the, um, combining all of the term and the preterm and then adjusting for age. Uh, if we sort of combine them, we get this very consistent finding of smaller hearts, smaller chamber sizes specifically. Function looks okay. LVEF is normal across the board. LV mass is lower. 
So here, you know, much lower uh, LV mass index in the preterm adolescents and the adults. And what's interesting, the wall thickness is normal, but you have a shorter heart same wall thickness. And as a result, the overall total sum through the cardiac, um, you know, the, the stack of cardiac uh, uh, images is the, the sum result is this lower cardiac mass overall. We see fairly similar findings in the RV with a smaller RV in systolic and in diastolic volume index. And again, at least this trend towards lower RV mass index. So within our group, we tended to have a normal to even hypercontractile phenotype with smaller heart, including smaller chamber sizes and lower mass index in the preterms. Uh, within this group, we also did some uh, T1 mapping that suggested increased fibrosis. So this was using a smart map looking specifically at the LV. Um, RV was not included due to technical difficulties with imaging the RV that's um, a challenge with MRI or not to mention echo. Um, but what we saw is that there was an increase in T1 fibrosis scores in the adults who were born preterm relative to those who were born at term. And I think one of the things that I found interesting and we're hoping to get to follow up in the near future is that there is actually a correlation between their T1 um, score, fibrosis score, and their APGAR score. So the lower their five minute APGAR, which is a pretty good predictor of resuscita resuscitation needs and um, ongoing intervention in the next few hours, the lower that five minute APGAR, the greater their fibrosis score, the more likely that they were, they were to have uh, one of these elevated values. And I will say that these fibrosis metrics also correlated with later diastolic dysfunction. Uh, so we do see clinical implications for this as well. So that's what our UW cohort was um, looked like. But I also want to share, and I'm sure most of you have already seen these slides before, um, the results from the Oxford Group's study and their cohort from 2013. And I, I bring this up because our in, in some ways our results are quite divergent. In other ways, uh, they overlap quite a bit. And so I'll, I'll walk you through that, what I mean by that. So the, in the blue, they have young adults who are born at, um, born preterm. In green, young adults born at term, and then in red, young adults born at term, but a decade older. So whether these are 25-year-olds, the reds are 35-year-olds. And what they saw was a significant increase in left ventricular mass. And this goes the opposite direction than what we found with a decrease in mass. But what they do see that's very similar is a smaller chamber size in the preterm individual and a shorter heart overall. Function here within the left ventricle was preserved, and they suggested that the, based on the degree of hypertrophy and increased mass, there may be at least a 50% increased risk for later cardiovascular events. With respect to the RV, they showed a uh, sort of graded response in RV hypertrophy. So if you were 32 to 36 weeks, um, had some, L, some RVH versus those were 28 to 31, even more right ventricular hypertrophy and most um, notable and those were less than 28 weeks. So this fairly robust RV hypertrophy response in the Oxford group um, with now evidence of right ventricular dysfunction in a subset of the young adults who were born preterm. So I bring that up um, and there are, have been several more studies um, published at this point, I could have shown you all of them in detail, but I bring up our two studies to demonstrate this concept or this idea that in the end, what we're looking at now in the um, long-term outcomes world uh, is that the, we think that there are probably multiple cardiac phenotypes of prematurity. And you guys probably see this in the NICU as well, but we're seeing that those phenotypes are presenting different ways as these individuals age uh, into adulthood. And so by and large, I've got you know a couple different color coded um, findings here. By and large, we've got you know a good chunk of studies of reporting increase in mass and LV hypertrophy. Um, these are all generally our almost all of our Oxford and uh, European studies, interestingly, that are reporting that increased mass. Versus more recently, a number of us re have reported this similar finding of decreased LV mass and um, normal wall thickness. So sort of divergent phenotypes in that standpoint. However, all of us would agree that this is a smaller heart. So I would presume it's sort of a growth restricted heart, but what you know really is driving that mechanistically, I think remains to be determined. 
overall LV function seems to be preserved, although we do see evidence of RV dysfunction in several of these studies. So a depressed RV ejection fraction, depressed RV ejection fraction uh, in a number. And so where, you know, I think the common um, findings are where there were, there are issues, they're more likely to be on the RV side of things, making our pulmonary vascular disease really important. They, these findings have really important um, clinical significance though, I think, because we're now beginning to recognize that there's an increased risk for the development of heart failure in childhood through early adulthood in individuals who are born preterm. These two papers, um, one from 2017 in Jack and one from 2021 in JAMA Peds, actually use the same data set to get to, um, to analyze. So I'll give you that information that they're just showing this information in two different ways ultimately. But the first specifically looked at grades of gestational age and the rates of uh, being diagnosed with heart failure. So you can see in uh, those who are born less than 28 weeks, a marked 17-fold increased risk for the development of heart failure. But what this, what um, D Dr. Crump did is to actually separate this out a little bit differently and look at this over time. And so when you look at this yellow line here, you can see that these individuals, these babies uh, born less than 28 weeks, the nearly half of those who have developed heart failure have done so within the first year. So these are babies you guys know about. They're developing heart failure while they're in the NICU. Um, I don't think anybody's missing these individuals. There's sort of a honeymoon period where things look okay. We don't have very many uh, additionally developing heart failure. And then these lines start to start to uptrend and potentially separate even more by the mid 20s and early 30s, which is quite early for a diagnosis of heart failure in adults. So I think that we'll continue to see these lines uh, separate and an increased rate of heart failure diagnoses uh, potential in uh, these individuals as they age, but obviously something that we need to continue to look at. So summary number two, like I mentioned, a consistently smaller heart. The contractile function varies, but generally the RV will be more impacted than the LV. We have seen evidence of diastolic dysfunction both in the RV and the LV, as well as evidence of LV fibrosis. And, you know, I think we could debate uh, what's driving that hypertrophy uh, in some of our studies versus not others. I've raised the question of whether this is somewhat akin to an old and new BPD, because to some extent, um, the dividing lines that we've seen of who's reporting hypertrophy and who's not sort of mirror the times that we've seen the changes in an old to new uh, BPD phenotype. And so it may be something in clinical practice that's driving these different uh, sort of divergent cardiac responses. Alternatively, it may be in part due to gestational age and the age at which um, we get terminal cardiac uh, myocyte accrual essentially and the point at which around 32 weeks we switch from a more uh, hyper hyperplastic growth pattern in the heart to a more hypertrophic growth pattern in the heart. So there are multiple potential uh, contributors here. So because we knew from this prior data that the RV tended to be more impacted, we had evidence of early pulmonary vascular disease, we wanted to know if we could, what we could do to impact that. Part of that came from our study um, that was a follow-up study of ventricular vascular coupling in our adults who underwent heart cath. So what that means with this coupling, um, coupling assessment is normally if the afterload increases, the ventricular contractility should also increase to sort of match that increased afterload that it's seeing. And if, so therefore, if you have a decrease in coupling, the RV is no longer increasing its contractility appropriately. So here we had two different metrics to look at this. The first was a volume only measure by MRI. So you see here, our preterms in red had lower uh, um, coupling relative to terms. And then a pressure only metric here, this was during the right heart catheterization. Again, similar findings where we have evidence of reduced ventricular vascular coupling. So we had the good fortune to pair uh, with a fantastic imaging group at the University of Wisconsin who had been using 4D flow and did a lot of 4D flow in our preterm cohort there. Um, they have lots of different ways to look at this, uh, but can look at the flow patterns, these sort of filling patterns. And one of the things that they had noticed was a fairly helical um, orderly flow in a term born individual versus a more disorganized and less energy efficient appearing 
uh, flow pattern in a preterm individual. So they went on to quantify these and uh, could indeed demonstrate that there was evidence of uh, diastolic dysfunction. I won't go into all of the details here, but I wanted to highlight this because specifically we wanted to use this technique to look at 40 flow, um, flow patterns within the heart in response to pul um, pulmonary vasodilator therapy and RV afterload reduction with sildenafil. So we recruited um, nine preterm individuals, no controls in this study to undergo sildenafil uh, and cardiac MRI with 40 flow before and after their dose of sildenafil. What we saw was um, a slight increase in heart rate and that's been described previously with sildenafil but also in overall, in several of the patients, at least an increase in stroke volume index and together these resulted in an increase in cardiac index as well. And when we looked at this with 4D flow, what was fairly interesting to think about uh, from an afterload reduction standpoint is that this that the dose of sildenafil or afterload reduction actually improved uh, efficient ventricular flow within the RV. So why do I say that? What they've done here, these are pre sildenafil images on top, is to look at flow as it enters and then exits uh, the, the right ventricle and through the pulmonary vasculature, the main PA here. When we look at this flow, the yellow uh, flow is retained inflow that just makes it into the ventricle, never, ex never exits. Uh, the blue starts a cardiac cycle in the ventricle and then exits but green is where the money's at. So green comes into the ventricle and then exits on a single cardiac cycle. So it isn't sort of swirling in there and is effectively ejected from the heart. And then in this, um, and then last red is blood that's essentially circulating within the heart for more than uh, for more than a full cardiac cycle, so two or more cycles. So what they could show really nicely um, by, by 4D flow imaging is that after sildenafil and afterload reduction in this heart, uh, we did have a more efficient flow pattern, which is sort of interesting to think about from a standpoint of how we might, might preserve RV function in particular in these individuals, whether or not they have a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So I'm going to stop here uh, with a you know, summary. I will refer you to this, this um, uh, review that we wrote last year, and this is the key figure from it, sort of this overview of the, the cardiac and vascular manifestations in adults who were born preterm. The key things to remember from a cardiac side, a cardiac standpoint are this reduced chamber size, reduced cardiac reserve, and the potential at least for systolic and diastolic dysfunction. From a vascular standpoint, we see decreased vascularity and more vascular stiffness. Um, I didn't go into a lot today, the mechanisms, uh, but we think that there's certainly impaired growth and decreased uh, both myocyte and vascular endowment in both uh, that contribute to these phenotypes that we see. And as a result, may see an increase in rates of heart failure, ischemic heart disease, uh, both systemic and pulmonary hypertension. Obviously, we've had a really large group at the University of Wisconsin because most of this data was acquired during the six years that I was there. So um, a number of people who've contributed to this. Um, but our lab is um, in transition right now. And so we've moved about a year ago to UT Southwestern. And so I'll, I'll close with some of the things that we've started since we moved because I hope to have a lot of new data in the near future to be able to share with you as well. I really think that there's a need for more detailed phenotyping beyond the NICU and understanding both resiliency and risk factors for both early and late cardiopulmonary dysfunction, particularly right ventricular pulmonary vascular dysfunction. So to get at this, um, we are currently recruiting adults who were born preterm at Parkland, which is our county-based hospital who's run a NICU database since 1986. So we have that database as sort of an extension of the EMR that we're able to go back and invite adults now to come in for new studies. Uh, currently, currently, this includes um, pulmonary function, echo, and overnight oximetry. So lots more data coming there soon. And then, um, you know, I think we do eventually need to get to some development of guidelines of clinical management for late sequelae. I do have a heart-lung clinic for adults who are born preterm here at UT Southwestern um, that, you know, that we we hope to be able to incorporate that into and also help educate others about the potential unique needs for this population. And I'll stop there and take any questions you guys have. 
Thank you very much, Kara. This was that was an excellent, excellent talk. Um, some fantastic new uh, data, and and uh, it looks like you're doing some great work, and there's a lot more coming, um, which will hopefully help our understanding of the long-term implications of this population. Um, I myself have many, many questions that have come through your, through your talk, and I've learned quite a bit. But before I go there, um, we'll just start taking some of the questions and take them to both you and all the three panelists that we have right now. Um, and I'm going to try and combine a couple of these questions, which um, um, one of the questions people are asking, and I think it sort of boils down to the problem of long-term outcome, uh, which I also have the same question is that it takes such a long time to get to that long-term outcome that by that time, the baseline population has changed. And as a day-to-day -day clinicians, we are always wondering um, what can we learn from a cohort which is now 30 years old where, or 25 years old or 20 years old when in an ICU, we know from a short-term outcome that our cohort has completely transformed even in the last 10 years itself. Um, and many, many new things have come up. So could you help us tie that sort of uh, bridge that gap? How do we take this back to our an ICU setting? So pre-surfactant era versus post. And I, th I know we use surfactant as a very major sort of uh, landmark, but it's not just that. It's antenatal steroids, non-invasive ventilation. The increasing in number of ventilation days was a very interesting data that you presented which is less and less used, gestational age has changed. Um, do you have any thoughts about how do current neonatologists reconcile that uh, with the changing cohorts? I think it's a challenge, first of all. I mean, this is, this is obviously true, and I've been trying to figure out how to get this across to reviewers for grants as we think about where we're going next, right? Because one of the things that's really um, unique and that I'm really excited about, about the cohort here at Parkland is the fact that it is essentially serves as an extension of the electronic medical record that goes back 35 years right now and contains all of their NICU data. So, it, I mean, it's not actually linked, but we have ways to, to do that. And so I keep looking at it thinking, why am I just recruiting adults? Why don't we recruit the entire age spectrum? Because we need to be able to see how these things sort of change over time. Um, and I, I think if you, if you can turn age into a more continuous variable, this is the problem we got into when we tried to look at our adults and adolescent cohorts together. There's such a discrepancy in age that the, the treatment paradigms were so different that yes, a lot of things look the same, but the things that look different, you don't have no idea why. And so until you can turn age into a continuous variable and then adjust for birth years, those are different, right? And which, you know, it gets into neonatal practice changes and things like that, that you can sort of have a, have a lens through which you look at that. Um, I, I don't know how else to do it, to get at that bigger question of, you know, that constantly evolving question is like, what have we really changed over time in our interventions? Anybody of the panelists who have an input and thoughts on how to do that better, but that's, that's what I want to do. You know, that's, um, that's what we're going to try to do here uh, over the next several years is to, is to think bigger. You know, we've been focused on these cohorts that were narrowly recruited and now we have this, this database here of 9,000 children and adults who are born preterm who we have this ability to, you know, to start to look and to think, well, you know, all of these and, and practice patterns, most of them change gradually over time. So if you have the specific practice pattern that you want to look at, you know, you can sort of tease those out uh, statistically to get an idea for what of our interventions have really made the biggest difference. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, first of all, Kara, uh, an amazing uh, talk. It's really wonderful to see how your work continues to evolve. And I, I really love the themes. I think to answer uh, the question that Amish posed, uh, I think about the data and then I think about screening. So I'll, I'll talk about the data. It's really interesting that the work that Kara presented and then the work that our colleague Adam Mundowski presented and then some of our own work uh, from St. Louis and then Amish, your work in Toronto, they're very similar themes and similar results. And all of these works come from different eras. The, the work from Kara and Adam come from the 1980s and 1990s, pre-surfactant, pre-steroids, different nutrition, different ventilatory strategies. The work that I present comes from 2010 to 2013. And again, that was an era where we were intubating every baby below 28 weeks. 
then Amish, the work that you present comes from a little bit later time, but there are very similar themes. So what it tells me is that there are preterm born individuals who are at risk for both pulmonary vascular and cardiovascular disease or phenotypes, however you want to slice or dice that. The way I interpret that is that we need to do a better job at screening. So I'll start in the, in the neonatal period. The thing that jumps to mind for all of us is those severe BPD infants who are at risk for pulmonary hypertension. For the most part, people screen for them around 36 weeks, but there are babies who are not having significant lung disease, but may be born less than 28 weeks, maybe IUGR, SGA, oligo, may have other risk factors that we should be thinking about screening for pulmonary vascular disease before 36 weeks. So that's one example where the work has translated across the arrows. And then finally, Kara alluded to this, uh, but she's too modest, but didn't go into much depth. In that paper that she recently wrote with Adam and Patrick, they outlined what you should do for a 20 year old who was born preterm and how you should approach them in these adult cardiovascular clinics. So it really goes back to screening and thinking about if you were born preterm, you are at risk for potential pulmonary vascular disease. While it may be subclinical, any type of infection, I won't mention the disease that we're all dealing with now, but could unmask a clinical phenotype. So that's the take home point where you take the data across errors and then you translate it into different screening protocols and practices. Gabriel, you had some thoughts. Yeah, I, I fully agree with what uh, Dr. Levy just mentioned. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank Dr. Goss for her outstanding presentation and for being such an advocate for our preemie graduates that end up into the adult clinics. I think the message needs to be translated even more so um, with you know, strong voices like yours towards adult colleagues throughout the world, because we have generations of premature infants that are now in the adult world. And often prematurity is not even looked at as one of the risk factors in many clinics. So it should almost become a standard of you know, being part of your checklist of knowing what was the gestation at which you were born, especially if you have added on risk factors like family history, smoking, uh, COPD, other types of lung disease or heart disease. So really thank you for the work you're doing because I think you are changing the face of our population of babies that are growing into these adolescent and adult clinics. Um, and I think that the work you're doing is extremely um, you know, relevant to our current populations because our current populations are getting more and more younger and they're getting more and more fragile and they're coming from you know, families that you know, potentially have obstetrical histories that are much more complex because obstetrical medicine is also evolving in many ways. So we're being you know, faced with newborns at the extreme of low birth weight in situations of uterine environments that are quite precarious with you know, maternal hypertension and growth restriction. And all of this has a lot of vascular imprinting um, causing both, you know, systemic and pulmonary changes. So I think that the work that you're doing will translate in many years of, um, you know, more outcomes of interest in a population that is growing to be more and more fragile. And in a way, these babies are going to come to adult clinics and probably they're going to have even further worsened pulmonary vascular disease because they had, you know, more lung lasting shunts, maybe they had more lung injury, maybe they're more fragile in their you know, repair mechanisms for both the heart, the lungs. And, and this is you know, circumscribed in a reality where obesity is, is climbing, where you know, habits about cardiovascular health are, changes, are changing. And, and obviously this also impacts our premature babies that are currently in our unit. So I think what you're doing is feeding what we're doing in our unit and hopefully we'll outline elements that we need to target to prevent those phenotypes. So, you know, you are presenting a lot about, you know, some of the myocardial fibrosis. So one of my questions that came up is how can we prevent this myocardial fibrosis from happening? Is there stem cell therapies like what Dr. Thibault is doing to modulate the inflammation that we could potentially prevent both part of the BPD and pulmonary vascular disease, as well as the myocardial changes. You know, and I think this is work that you're doing that will feed into the NICU to help us prevent having all these adult clinics filled with patients in heart failure and filled with patients with pulmonary hypertension that is extremely significant at a young age. You know, you, you mentioned it, being 30, being 25, and having already signs of, you know, depressed RV performance 
or LV performance is very significant. I worked with the team of Dr. Nui on the HAPI study that you mentioned, and, and we could already see some patients with, you know, frank diastolic or systolic dysfunction on both the LV and RV side. So this is very concerning when you're only 25 and, and quite striking, uh, actually. So I can only see this as extremely pertinent to our current populations. We, we've had two so far of our first 10 uh, preterms come in now with reduced LVEF, and I was shocked. I, I just wasn't prepared to see two out of the first 10 with, with uh, overt heart failure, essentially. Yeah. So kind of the theme that seems to be going around in this conversation is really the homogenization of the prematurity in, in adult studies? And then really, how do we better integrate the complexity of that when we, we do these studies? And, and you mentioned, uh, Dr. Goss, looking at a continuous timeline from the neonatal period all the way to adulthood. And I think this is a great opportunity with some members that are part of the neonatal research center with the increase now in research that's happening with neonatal hemodynamics, is this an opportunity to really bridge that gap between what's happening in the neonatal period and the adult period and kind of combine our forces, so to speak, to try to answer these questions for our patients and for our, our co-providers? Yeah. Sorry, Shamla, you have a comment. First off, fantastic presentation. Uh, the data is amazing, and the way you integrated everything is also really, really outstanding. Thank you for that very much. Bench scientists tend to be splitters rather than lumpers, and so I really hear the uh, the idea of, of trying to tease apart all of these threads that, uh, by definition, epidemiology has to lump together. And I was particularly struck. Um, Gabrielle mentioned the cardiac fibrosis. I was struck by the fact that that correlated with the five-minute APGAR, which got me thinking about, is this like a direct hypoxia hit at that five-minute point, which we do know also tracks with neurological dysfunction? Or are we talking about the five-minute APGAR as a proxy for general illness score? And actually what we're uh, revealing is that Myocardial dysfunction, myocardial um, dysregulation actually tracks with all of the interventions that we do in order to keep the sicker babies alive. And I'm thinking about as overt as the um, cardiac meds that we're using for inotropy and perhaps as unovert as nutrition um, context of IUGR other acquired endothelial dysfunction, and more specifically, um, one thing that might um, explain some of the discrepancies in long-term phenotype where you have um, hypertrophy versus loss of myocardial mass, um, Warburg phenomenon and Warburg metabolic changes in the myocardium. And, whether we are, some of what we are doing is inducing metabolic phenotypes that will be visible as di diverging structural phenotypes. Um, I'm trying to kind of pull a whole lot of thoughts into that, but a lot of what we're doing in terms of clinical practice in the sicker cohort, in those who would have had that um, low five minute APGAR score and that we're struggling with during the course in NICU, a lot of our interventions may affect myocardial um, patterning, myocardial metabolic patterning, and result in changes that we are seeing as myocardial structural change. I'm just pitching that to you to see whether, I don't know that we have a way to uh, investigate this in. I agree with, with all but, of that. So the, um, the five minute app are actually correlated um, stronger than the one minute. So it suggests it's not just, you know, the birthing process itself and looking bad the first minute, but, you know, that baby that you can, you can get turned around in the first few minutes that's already starting to perk up is already looking better. And, you know, whether, whether that's 
whether that's the um, in utero to immediate postnatal period priming and changing those, or it's the interventions that are, you know, whether it's what's happening right before that five minutes APGAR or what's happening right after that five minute APGAR, I think is really unclear. We do see in the postnatal hyperoxia animal models that uh, we do end up with LV fibrosis um, and their um, Gene Black's group has shown that in the um, sheep model, the sheep lambs um, as, as well, that even when they're ventilated in essence. So, but it's the same, you know, it's the same sort of, you know, they're not a traumatic delivery necessarily, but um, well, I don't know, I guess maybe that argues that it's more of the intervention side if it's not a traumatic delivery and so forth. But they did vary the oxygen tension, didn't they? If I remember in, right in the in the large animal studies. Yeah, yeah, and I'm and and oxygen again is one of your bucket of toxic yeah. things that we do to these kids. Right, right. The question as to whether we can tease apart also chicken and egg here. Um, you had some fantastic data showing um, the, the sort of loss of distensibility of the pulmonary circuit and the um, effect of prematurity regardless of BPD on the loss of distensibility in the pulmonary circuit. Is that driving the myocardial dysfunction or is there a primary hit to the myocardium separate from the primary hit to the pulmonary vasculature? And the relevance of that to, to treatment would be, would dropping the pulmonary vascular resistance with say sildenafil, plucking an, a, a drug out of the air, um, would that improve the myocardial dysfunction or are these two separate hits? So I think they're uh, two independent things and there's a lot of overlap, obviously the same sort of tox toxins and stimulants and things that may drive both of them, but that's, it's unquestionably in my mind is an independent cardiac insult as well. It's not just a heart that's responding to the, um, you know, to, to the afterload and the pressure changes. It, the heart is taking a hit here too. And I say that in large part because, um, you know, when I, if I would see, I, when, when I would see, so I do pulmonary hypertension, RV failure clinically. And when I see these mild pulmonary pressures in a patient diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension in, a, in adulthood that started in adulthood, their RV's fine. They're all RV's unequivocally fine. So the fact that we see them with this degree of our, any degree of RV dysfunction, um, it, I think is striking. And, you know, certainly these, I, I think there's a unique Insult. So the sildenafil is really interesting. You mentioned all the metabolic changes and so forth. And sildenafil actually has direct cardiac metabolic effects, um, inotropic effects, lusotropic effects, metabolic effects. So it's an interesting drug. We chose it for our study for lots of reasons. It's easy to give for one, but um, it, it's not straightforward. It's a little bit messy because it does have these sort of off target. You're not just reducing afterload with sildenafil. So it may have um, direct cardiac effects that we don't really pay a whole lot of attention to uh, it when you're using it in the NICU. Yeah. So I, you know, in an essence of time where we're coming to a close of our webinar, I wanted to thank everybody for coming and, and end with a, a couple of comments and questions brought together from the audience, which is, you know, as we continue to embark on this very interesting research on what happens to our babies when they become adults, we already have families that treat these babies as fragile and they worry about, um, exercise endurance. And, you know, we talked to Dr. Levy who mentioned maybe earlier screen, screening, earlier mitigation, um, you know, just some thoughts for the group and thoughts for the panelists as we go forward is how do we do this research? When should we start looking at these kids? How do we counsel families and then really bring this to the pediatricians as well so that they start looking at these things and maybe there's there's a missing time period there where we're looking at a lot of this in neonatology and now the adults are seeing it in the adult world, but really what's happening in our pediatric clinics and, and how do we help families with that? I don't know if anyone has any closing thoughts maybe, before we end. Maybe I'll just add one more thing, Lauren, Mayer. how do you convince grant agencies to give you money to study this in a bigger way? Uh, 
because uh, as a as an independent reviewers who including cardiologist and 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 uh, the reason i ask is obviously you can tell that i've been burned by this um <laughs> and and uh, we we get we get cross sections from different parts of the world and and some fantastic data and and, and it's exciting imaging um and they all give us a snapshot at that particular thing but as you were saying kara what you need is a really but a longitudinal cross section at different ages to try and tie the story together perhaps starting at an icu discharge in a certain cohort uh, to see how things are progressing or in in whichever modality is possible but the question again becomes as shamla was saying is chicken and egg thing because there's a lot going on um, during an icu there's a lot goes on after an icu life exercise obesity hypertension eating patterns all of which the preterm babies are at higher risk of um and they repeatedly have been shown to have lower exercising uh, lower activity higher uh, you know um, lipid profiles are worse um and then the question becomes how much of this the phenotype in a young adulthood is directly linked to prematurity um and can we take it all the way back to the abgar score which is right in the very beginning of life um and how do you tease these different risk factors occurring at different time points to try and give you that final phenotype that you are seeing um and and uh, the the sample sizes that we individually have just doesn't allow us the luxury to be able to figure all this out um and i i have certainly for one is struggling to convince a um convincing our cihr body to give us money to do this long term type of assessments in a, in, a, in a group of babies and phil has been a part of that discussion with me and we sort of failed three times now because the same questions keeps coming um how would you assess how much is an icu how much is post and how many things can you um, get from the cohort how do you tackle this 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 question in your i'll project? try and uh, i'll try and answer then kara will jump in even though i failed with you uh, amish i think the answer because i know there's a lot of people on the call from around the country uh and around the world uh the answer is you start partnering at your local institution with your obstetricians the neonatologists the pulmonologists you know you start locally and then you you start to branch out with those um multidisciplinary collaborations to local and national international collaborations where you're putting together an attractive grant that carries on the swim lane and takes a piece from each kind of uh ob nicu pulmonary cardiac all the way through adulthood and have to have unique kind of um um uh, questions asked but i think the true answer is when you're trying to design a study it can't only be observational you then have to think about the mechanism and that's where i think kara's strength has come in over the years with people like adam lewandowski where you have to go back to the mouse models back to the animal models you have to have a mechanistic arm of your proposal and then the observational and then to round it all out amish what you have done even almost 2.0 is then the interventional and then how can we identify uh approaches that can alter the phenotype so it's really not just one grant it's a series of grants in a 1 3 5 7 and 10 year paradigm i think that's that's what we've done you know kara and patrick yourself and and gabriel um and chamla where where you're working beyond the confines of your own laboratory to answer the questions that are in front of us anyone has many more thoughts or we want to sign off with this i, I think involving families involving patients involving you know people who live with these conditions you know as major stakeholders within these grants within advocates for you know the overall population is extremely important because you know it goes straight to the heart and sometimes reviewers will be very impacted by the fact that you have you know family oriented or patient or oriented outcomes like what are we trying to change you know how much of this cardiac issue are actually impairing the life of these patients and impairing their development or their way to perform or their way to actually evolve in the society and how much cost is that bring to the society because we're not able to identify it in you know a rapid way and efficient way and address it because we don't have the knowledge to be able to address it and correct it and I think this has a huge impact because our population of preemies is growing um and our population of extreme preemies are even more so growing in many cohorts across the globe um and that has definitely a big up you know uh, impact in in pediatrics and in our children so definitely involving families and 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 
and kids and adults who are previously preemies um, in these projects, I think will also be part of future venues to, to push towards getting funds for these important research projects. I'd like to make a pitch also for very careful animal modeling. Um, as, as you mentioned, trying to tease apart the, the mechanism for many of these things, you really do wind up going to um, animal models, but not every model models every disease. And so we have to be very selective about which disease we're modeling and with what animal at what stage of development and how we match that to the human longitudinal. Um, can, I make, can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come in from out left field, not on the panel. Um, <laughs> just to, to make a very, very strong comment here that this is a health care crisis for the future. Um, the data Cara and Adam have shared with us are babies we don't worry about today. And we are generating a population of extreme risk. Obviously, there's a huge investment in helping tiny babies to survive, but I think we have to be cognizant of two things. One, our healthcare system is not designed to follow these patients to the degree of rigor during childhood that's needed. We focus on neurodevelopmental outcomes. The only children from a cardiovascular perspective who tend to get followed are the patients who are the worst, okay? There's many, many babies that probably have subclinical pulmonary vascular disease and all sorts of abnormalities that just don't come to the radar. So I think to get to answer Amish's questions, I think there needs to be a lot of lobbying and advocacy for these tiny babies. And if we don't have that, we're going to have a big problem here because the people who are most interested in this are people like Adam and Cara at the adult end and neonatologists. And in the middle, you've got a gap. Uh, pediatric cardiology has it evolved, really focuses on congenital heart disease. The longitudinal evaluation of these children from a heart-lung perspective, there's not a huge consistent investment in that. And I think that's really, really important. So I feel, I feel strongly about this. It's people like on this call that are gonna solve the problem. So coming together. Awesome. Go on, Lauren, you can sign off us, sign us off. Well, thank you so much for joining us and just a, a reminder to email the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center if you have uh, a group or an interest um, and wanna hear more about what we're doing. And um, thank you to the panelists for coming and sharing your expertise. And thank you so much, Dr. Goss, for your presentation and your incredible work that you've been doing to help our tiny babies. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you for the great webinar. It was really a great discussion. And